Good afternoon, everyone. We're just, um, people are just getting started, getting situated here. So we're going to take a minute or so to let the uh, uh, participants uh, start stacking up. We're, we're watching people coming in. We're actually, uh, we're expecting our record-breaking crowd today, and we appreciate everyone's interest in, in learning more um, about what, what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, going through the, um, the recruiting and interviewing process. And we really these tips uh, these tips should come become extremely valuable when you're going through the process. Um, so we're we're just coming in now. The the, uh, the the attendees are just signing in, and let's give them a minute as the uh, the numbers just um, escalating quite quick quickly here. So and what one hour will go will go by very fast. Um, and if anyone has any questions following the presentation, feel feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to uh, to respond in real time. So I'm going to get us started. Um, welcome to our, our monthly webinar. Um, our, we typically have our advisors leading the webinar, and the webinar is focused on once you're in the position, becoming the best strategic business partner that you possibly can be. Today, we decided to take a little bit of a twist on it, uh, bringing in uh, some of our own team and uh, Wendy Wiener from outside our organization uh, to really help people understand and to better appreciate what are the mistakes and what do you really need to do to position yourself for success. So this is part of our monthly GC Advantage. If, um, if you're not familiar, we do this on a monthly basis. Um, you can check us out online. Uh, we have uh, really great programs and really great guests. Uh, our advisors are so well connected in industry. They usually will have CEOs or board members or other general counsel join us. So um, the GC Advantage program, we're happy to hear so many people take advantage of it on a monthly basis. Um, the, the, our next webinar will be next month, February 21st, and strategies to effectively manage external counsel near and far. So that means uh, in the U.S. and abroad. Um, I know it seems to be a big concern where, as we're meeting with CEOs doing alignment meetings for GEC searches. We're seeing, um, seeing a lot of tension on, uh, attention on uh, the selection of outside partners and the cost involved with it. Uh, we're, we're happy to take your questions during the, during the presentation, so feel free to reach out. Um, we can't get to all of them, but we'll try to reach out uh, or answer these as we go along. Um, I'm also going to try to leave 10 minutes at the end so we can catch as many as possible. But feel free to ask questions, and in real time, we'll try to get to them. Now, today, from uh, from a speaker standpoint, you have me, John Gilmore, one of the founders of uh, Barker Gilmore with my uh, business partner, Bob Barker. Um, we have uh, Brittany McDonough who's one of our partners, and Brittany is the chair of our healthcare and life sciences practice. Every year, she, she sets all-time records for the firm with the bookings that she's done. She's helped more people land these positions than anyone I know. Um, Brittany's just a fabulous resource. Today, she's going to cover um, mistakes people are making throughout the interview process. Next, we have Max Galertner. A uh, former big law lawyer joined Barker Gilmore and hit the ground running. Uh, Max has been just a, a gem for us. He's uh, so committed to helping others succeed. Um, he's he's first to get on a plane and and meet people and help people. Um, I really think um, you know the quid pro quo here. Uh, Max helped so many people and people are happy to help him. So he doesn't specialize in any one industry. Um, he's had some amazing searches that he's filled the, the, this past year, Fortune 500 GCs, but uh, many mid-levels and many deputy GCs or GC successors. And, and finally, uh, we have uh, Wendy Wiener. Wendy um, is someone that I just happened to meet along the way. Uh, she's founder um, of uh, The Writing Guru, and Wendy really is a, a writing guru, and writing gurus are tough to come by around here. Um, so I appreciate it. She doesn't have a connection to Barker Gilmore. There's no financial incentive. Um, I just found when, um, when I've seen Wendy's work product, what she's doing to help position others for success, whether it comes to writing a resume, 
uh, preparing their LinkedIn bio, uh, what she what she believes in and what she uh, counsels people, I, I'm all for it. So she has some really, really terrific tips. I think she's one of the stars in the industry when it comes to resume writing. People are constantly asking me for a referral. So my referral out there is going to be for Wendy. So uh, Wendy's going to cover uh, the mistakes that people tend to make when writing a resume or, or preparing their LinkedIn bio, which, by the way, the LinkedIn bio is incredibly important. So all that said, um, I'm going to pass it off. We're going to start this process, like I say, for it. We've broken the, the, the search process into four categories. Number one, uh, the resume and uh, LinkedIn bio presenting your materials. Number two, networking and identifying the opportunities. Number three, the actual interview itself. And I'm going to be uh, doing cleanup when it comes to negotiating the offer and uh, onboarding. So I'm going to start it off, pass it off to Wendy and let her take it from here. Thanks so much, John, for having me and for the warm introduction. So I'm going to dive into top legal resume mistakes that I see on a daily basis and that often come across my desk. And one of the things that happens with a lot of uh, legal job seekers is most people start off by just continuing on from their law school template and adding to their resume. And what it becomes is this never ending laundry list of bullet points detailing the responsibilities, but not really showcasing accomplishments, achievements, or unique value. And I put this chart on the bottom because it's really important to understand that your personal brand is a combination of how you see yourself and how others see you. So your resume is merely just a snapshot, right? It's, it's about the reader, the reader's interest, their 30,000 foot view. When we say the reader, in this case, we're talking about legal recruiters. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, what are they looking for? And what do you have that matches it? Um, one of the things that I always suggest is looking at your three to five major areas of expertise and zeroing in on that. Um, you're not going to be an, a subject matter expert in every single area, but as a corporate generalist, you're going to have a broad range of knowledge. And if you have specialized expertise, let's say you're a licensed patent attorney, let's say, for example, you're really well-versed in data privacy issues, those are going to be areas that you're going to want to convey to the reader. So when it comes down to it, you're also going to have to showcase what you've done factually in your different corporate counsel roles to showcase those accomplishments and contributions and your unique value. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is stand out from the other candidates. So how do you do that? Things like, do you have prior AMLAW 100 experience? Have you worked in-house for a public company? Are you concentrating on startups or high growth companies. Um, think about specific industry experience, just like John mentioned about Brittany's area of expertise. She's in healthcare and life sciences. And if you're wanting to either transition into that arena or you're already in that arena and you want to stay in that sector, it's really important to let the reader know at the top third of that resume in that roadmap section called the professional summary, where your areas of expertise are, and then make sure that you're not just giving this laundry list of skills, but really honing in on those achievements and contributions. So thinking about things that a GC does, building or restructuring a legal department, mitigating risk, uh, handling major issues between the board and the C-suite, maybe taking a company through an IPO. There's major contributions and facets of what you're doing as a GC that really need to be drawn out. Um, and so because the resume is a snapshot, and if, if you kind of go down to bullet point three, that four to five to six page resume, no one wants to read that. No one wants to read a four page resume. In fact, most legal recruiters are going to tell you they don't even want to read a three page resume. So what do you do? Well, you have to remember that the further back you go in your work history, the more remote and ancillary things become. So if you're a GC and you're looking to make a lateral move as an, another GC or CLO of a company, then you're going to want to focus on your GC competencies and your GC experience. Whereas your earlier stuff, so let's say, for example, you worked at Latham for eight years and you did capital markets transactions, that's really important. You may want to mention in the top third 
of your resume that you have AMLA 100 experience and put Latham and Watkins in your uh, in parentheses, but you're probably not going to have much detail because that's the very, very early stage of your career. So just something to remember. Um, the other thing that's going to be really important is making it easy for the reader to parse through your legal resume. So if you have 20 bullet points without any organization whatsoever for your GC role or your deputy GC role, it's going to be really hard for that reader, meaning the recruiter, to delve into where are your experiences related to your M&A transactions, where are your experiences related to governance and data privacy. So I like to organize bullet points many times by competency areas for GCs, especially ones that have had long tenures at companies and maybe have gone from corporate, you know, just a regular corporate counsel into the executive corporate counsel category. Um, another thing to think about is that progression across both your current role or maybe current company and across your career. Showcasing that value to a legal recruiter, maybe you came in as a senior counsel and you stepped into an interim GC role for six months and really transformed the company's infrastructure, uh, marketability, and across the business landscape. All of those things are going to be really, really important. Um, another thing that I would also say is legal resumes follow and favor that classic modern design. So and if you go to my website, writingguru.net, I actually have a GC sample on my website that kind of shows you sort of that modern classic design of how you really want to frame the resume. Remember, a person's eyes naturally gaze at the center of a page. So centering your headlines, doing things like that will really help optimize for the reader. Because remember, your resume is not just about you. It's really about what the reader is looking for. Wendy, I'm going to jump in. I have a couple of things that I get turned off when I see a resume. You might might disagree with me. Um, one is um, the cutesy pictures and um, the artwork and things and different colors. Um, what do you what do you think about that? Is that acceptable or not? I do not use graphs or charts, and I don't like them. They're great if you're in the marketing industry. They're great if you're a creative professional, but it's not what a company wants to see from its general counsel or chief legal keep officer. Keep it professional. What about um, one of my pet peeves is resumes that have the word I in it. I'm not a fan of the I. I like instead of I lead, it says should, should, it should say lead. Um, what what do you think about the word I? Is there a place for it in uh, in a resume or no? I would say no. Resume is more formal. LinkedIn is meant to be more conversational. So right. I use pronouns in a LinkedIn profile, but I never use pronouns in a resume. That's why I knew I liked you right from the start. We haven't <laughs> even rehearsed this. Very and, conservative and approach. Finally, my um, my last pet peeve is a five page resume. 35 years doing this, my I still hold the record. I've never placed any candidate with a five page resume. Um, so Wendy's saying four page plus here, we're on the same page. I mean, it should let's stick to a three-page resume. Um, and and one one last question. I've been seeing a lot of resumes come across, and these are not like old timers, but they're eliminating dates, dates of graduations, even some dates of employment. What do you think about not putting dates on a resume? That's a great question. So I'm in my mid-40s, and a lot of my clients are around the same age, or sometimes you know, 10 to 20 years older than me. And some of them actually fear job uh, age discrimination in the job search. So if if the candidate has, you know, graduated law school 20 plus years ago, and has been, you know, practicing for that length of time, I don't know if law school graduation dates matter. I know that there's a personal preference. So if a client came to me and said, hey, let's put dates back on for my graduation, no problem. Typically, uh, you can do it for bar admissions. Um, for earlier career experience, I will put dates, um, but it'll be year to year. Um, so maybe someone who, let's say, started practicing in 1995 and, and worked at an AMLA 100 firm, that's going to be really important um, in terms of the, the law firm title and maybe if they were in a very specific practice group. So I like to sometimes put associate attorney, comma, capital markets transactions, or for example, corporate department. So this way a reader knows 
that they're not going to dive into all that detail, but they're going to at least know about the earlier career. It's better to be transparent and forthright than to try to hide things um, as well. Um, yeah. I, I think advice. if you don't have gaps in your resume and you're, you're I mean, I'm, I'm in my late fifties and I'm still young. Fifties is young and long. It is. I mean, and, and what I find is, um, especially CEOs and boards, they want someone with more experience and less experience. So um, I, I, we don't run into any age discrimination in our business. I mean, people are looking for the lawyer that's had more experience, the better. So, um, you know, just unless you're obviously, it, it has to be position appropriate. If you're, if you're report responding to a, an opportunity that they're looking for a very young lawyer, um, you have very, I shouldn't say young, but very few years of experience because it's an entry level, obviously uh, 20 plus years of career experience isn't going to, isn't going to be helpful. But if you're applying for mid to senior level position, eight dates, the more, the better. So I'll just say, I, that, that's my thought. All right. Sorry to interrupt. I'll let you continue. I think you have one more slide. Yes. <laughs> So LinkedIn, now this is an area that a lot of people don't think about, right? Because they're very focused on their resume and sending their resume out that they often overlook the power of LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is extremely powerful because if you think about it, your resume is sent to a hand curated audience, right? Executives, recruiters, companies that you choose to send it to. Whereas your LinkedIn profile casts a really wide net. So it gets you seen and noticed when you may not even be looking for a job. So there are probably people on this webinar that are thinking about making a move sometime in 2024. It may not be for six to nine months, but you'll want to start proactively updating your LinkedIn profile because that is a place of first impression. And there's you know over 900 million users on LinkedIn. So there's opportunities for you to even be seen and noticed when you may not be actively pursuing a job search. And let's face it, the market is evolving. And if you've ever been in a situation where you've been caught off guard and uh, let go because of a business restructuring, the first thing that you're going to run and do is update your resume and your LinkedIn profile. Why not take proactive steps to keep it updated now? So one of the things that I see that's, I think, a big mistake is dumping your legal resume into your LinkedIn profile and making it sound like an obituary. Um, really, it looks very static. Um, it looks like you put no effort into it. And let's face it, a recruiter or hiring executive is not looking to read 20 bullet points or multiple paragraphs of detail in your experience section. They're gonna focus on key areas, your headline, your about summary section, job titles, and skills. And they're also gonna look at dates, of course, and companies you've worked at, et cetera. But the way that you rank higher in search results are these areas. And of course, you want to include your location. So if you're putting United States, but you're really centered in New York City, that's a really hot and big market. So why not put New York City as your location and put locations of places that you've worked, especially if you're someone that's had global experience. Um, another thing that people do often when it comes to a headline is they put keywords in there that are not necessarily the most searchable keywords. So you should put your job title you should put the company you work for. And one thing that I like to do is it's not always common sense of what companies are public. Sure, of course, if it's you know one of the FANG companies, you know that it's a public company, but there are some smaller public companies that may not be as well known. And if you work for a public company, you should put the ticker symbol in your headline next to the company name. Um, if you've got prior AMLA 100 experience, you want to call that out. Um, so a lot of people just kind of default to their job title and never think about maybe a couple of areas of expertise or industry that they're in. So for example, um, if you're in healthcare and life sciences, you're going to want to put that industry in your headline because that's the industry you want to stay in. If you're in high tech or if you're in the startup world, that's going to be really, really important. Um, and the other thing that I do see that happens a lot is people get on LinkedIn, they perfect their profile and they say, okay, I'm waiting for people to reach out to me, but I'm not hearing anything. I put on the open to work and uh, I, I'm not hearing anything. Well, here's the thing about LinkedIn. Recruiters are busy. Hiring executives, managing executives at companies are busy. And not every CEO is sitting on LinkedIn day after day. But you want to be able to populate if they're running a search. So what I say is pick 
target companies of interest, start following their pages on LinkedIn, look at things about what they're posting, what's interesting in the market, who from that company might be active on LinkedIn and build a connection with them. The world that we're living in today is not the same as it was when I graduated law school in 2003 and you faxed over your resume and you heard back from the office manager at the company um, or the you know HR executive. Now it is, is a game of basically cat and mouse. You have to chase people down. You have to build connections. You have to remain at the top of their mind when the next opportunity comes. Um, and so you should be building a network of what I call targeted people of influence, company CEOs, other GCs, CCOs, key decision makers, people who are where you want to be now, five years from now, 10 years from now, because I'm sure many of you have seen where a GC is stepping down and they're hiring for their department or their replacement, or maybe they're looking to bring in a deputy GC. Imagine if you were their connection on LinkedIn, you saw that post, you'd feel comfortable reaching out to them one-on-one -on -one and striking up a conversation. So it's not just about what I call spray and pray. It's really about building real life connections and getting on the radar of people. For sure. And I'll just jump in one thing um, that I see is a pretty typical mistake. I, I, I'm a big fan of a, a, a professional picture on your LinkedIn page, not the picture of you on your boat or the golf course or at someone's wedding. Get a professional picture. Make, make yourself. The executive presence shows through on the, the LinkedIn page. Um, I can really put together the personality and the image when I, when I see the people. So I would just say that for those of you who don't have a professional picture, get it done. One last comment on that. Never have a, a typo on your LinkedIn page. It's really bad news to have a typo on your LinkedIn page. What the, the message there is, have someone else review your LinkedIn page before it goes live. All right, that was great, Wendy. I really appreciate it. Now we're going to go to Max. And Max is going to talk about networking and the, some of the mistakes people make there. So, thanks, John. Yeah. So, with networking, you know, I think one of the first biggest mistakes uh, that people make are being reactive instead of proactive. You know, as I to say, the day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit. We recommend more than anything to establish a relationship with an executive search consultant early on. You know, when I when I speak with a lot of my candidates, I usually tell them. You know, you are the sun and I can either be Mercury or Pluto, but it's good that I'm in orbit around you because whenever you need that time for when it's time to reach out to me, just shoot me an email, shoot me a text and we can pick up the conversation because, you know, what's pretty unique about Barker Gilmore is that we never post our opportunities online and we only truly recruit through the networks that we've developed over the past two decades. And another important thing to consider is that many of our searches, including our Fortune 500, GC, and CCO searches, are confidential. And so essentially, I mean, we are looking for the best people in the market, not on the market. And so when clients understand that, they don't want us posting these online because people who are just scraping for jobs, they go to that. We're much more relationship-driven, relationship-building, and that's how we get to understand candidates. And when you you speak to an executive recruiter, the odds are better to become a general counsel. I'm a big fan of numbers. And so when we, we surveyed uh, general counsel who were uh, brought in externally, and then we kind of try to see how did you land where you landed? And 13% just through proactive networking, 17% through a job posting, 19% when the company directly reached out to them. 22% preferred by a colleague, and 29 to 30% was from our executive recruiter. And so if you can increase your chances by 30% for anything, especially something as important as your job becoming a general counsel, why not? And so, you know, it's, uh, and so I guess to, towards the next thing is when another big mistake is that people feel a little guarded when they speak to a recruiter. They feel like they can't open up. They're trying, trying just to impress us with only sharing the good. And so what I say is it is so vital for transparency. You know, I call it the candidate recruiter privilege, attorney client privilege, whatever it is. But confidentiality is the benchmark of our business. And it starts and ends with trust. Because when the client brings us in, 
we are advocating for our client. But when we are presenting our candidates to our client, we are your advocates. And the best way for us to be your advocates is if you share with us everything. And the more transparent you are, you know, share with us your strengths. It's very important to know that. But it's also important to understand the gaps in your, your experience. You know, uh, something I, I think I saw in some of the questions, you know, what about, um, you know, some time where whether there's a sabbatical or there's time in between jobs, you know, you know, whether you're litigating and you're you have to have, you have bad facts. It's important to inoculate those. It's important to share with us as recruiters all of the stories and all of the information so we can better present advocate on your behalf. Um, and it's also especially true. You know, when if you are being proactive and you just want to reach out to us, you know, it's something that I've learned, you know, since joining Barker Gilmore and meeting so many incredible candidates is that, you know, as a general counsel or as a DGC or as a senior counsel, as a lawyer, sometimes it's very hard to to kind of brag about yourself. And I say you know, it's important, but you can also be truthful. And it's really important to share all those accomplishments because what when I hear it, you know, there might be a gap in your resume. There might be a gap in experience. But if you're sharing something, it's easy to make analogies. And it's good for us to say, listen, objectively, we are recruiters. We know what our can our clients want. I can tell you that you're missing this. And it's important over the next year or two to kind of seek those responsibilities out. Raise your hand. Go for them. And so the more that you share with us, the more we can give an honest assessment of uh, of where things are. And it's also it's also important to think about your community and your network. You know, we share. You know, when we the, we do reach out with a refer uh, an opportunity, it may not be the right time. It may not be the right fit. But you should really consider those, and your network might be interested. What goes around comes around. I'm a big believer in that, and I can. And the results show for itself that a lot of our candidates that we meet and that we place are referred to us through their networks, and so. I think on the on the last the last bit, I think Wendy Wendy talked about it uh, you know, very well. It was about LinkedIn. Um, but something I, I usually tell my candidates is, would you hire yourself based on your LinkedIn? Would you take a look at it? And if you saw it, what would you do? And it's it's very it's it's surprising how few people uh, update that LinkedIn and let it reflect because it's as a recruiter, we see we maybe spend three to five seconds. I mean. Personally, maybe you can really hit all the major points and, uh, and make sure that LinkedIn is is top notch is important. So uh, those are some of the mistakes on, on you know, when it comes to networking um, and hand it over to, to Brittany for the next uh, segment. That, well, that sounds great. Um, one one of the things that you said, Max, that really resonates well is there's a difference between looking for a job, moving from law firm to law firm and looking for an in-house opportunity. And mm. I, I recall um, most law firm recruiters, what they when they when they speak to a candidate, the first thing they're looking for is an exclusive relationship. Let me re represent you to the different law firms, because law firms pretty much they'll work with a lot of different recruiters when we're working in house. It's a very exclusive relationship. So mm -hmm. we have a retained or exclusive uh, opportunity to fill a position with a company. And one of the things we strive for is building a relationship with a company that they want to come back to only our firm over and over again. So my point is, we will have relationships with companies that our competitors don't have, and they have relationships with companies that we don't have. So un unlike law firm recruiters that will pre will seek this exclusive relationship with their candidates they represent, the lawyers they represent, we don't. Um, we're happy to, ha to help you get a land an opportunity of a lifetime. And I, my first thing I'm going to tell anyone is you want to have relationships in place with other recruiters because they'll have assignments we don't have and we'll have assignments they don't have. So anyway, the point is, Get yourself out there, select a few high quality firms that you can trust. Mac, I love that word trust, Max. You really have to trust and believe in the people that you're establishing these relationships with so that the opportunity, when the opportunity comes, we might have it, they might have it, and you stay informed of it. And I'll say this, every day we walk into our firm, 
and we have no idea what's coming out of snacks. It's like amazing that what what a company will call and either a GC announced retirement or a company just took someone from a, from another company uh, or lost someone to another company and they need to make a hire. And so um, the the world of of executive search when it comes to in house. It's constantly changing. Um, you know, a company today might might feel so happy and so secure and love everyone on their team, and just like that, somebody's gone the next day. So I mean, it's 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 um, fast times out there, and many times even as we talked about in our in our intro here, these these opportunities that are hidden opportunities. We see companies looking to upgrade a particular component of their law department, and it's unfortunately it's done on a confidential basis, meaning the people in that role today don't know that the search is going on. So, you know, again, we'll have some opportunities that are hidden opportunities that no one else has, and there'll be other opportunities from other recruiters. So you want to do that. And as Max said, recruiters are only one component. There's a lot of word of mouth from you know law firm partners making the referrals. Um, there's board members that are making referrals. There are colleagues that you went to law school that are making referrals. So you know it's whether it's an external referral uh, or it's a company seeking out seeking someone directly or it's through a recruiter. Um, imagine cutting off thirty percent of your chances because because you're not you're not taking one of those different avenues. Um, Brittany, do you have anything to add to that? I um I, I agree with everything you you both said. I think I I would just say to don't be afraid to let individuals and in your opportunity know that you're open to new opportunities. I think sometimes people who don't need an opportunity and they're happy and they're well received, there's some hesitation to say, hey, I want to make a move because they think they worry about the perception. Oh, what's going on? Is he not doing well? Is he or she not well received? Is the company in trouble? Um, and it's okay to let people know that you're opportunistic and you're willing to listen but don't assume that people know you're opportunistic and willing to listen. I think sometimes it just takes that initiative to say, hey, if you ever hear about any great opportunities, I'd love whether you're talking to an executive recruiter or just a colleague in your network, mm -hmm. um, just make it known. And you don't necessarily have to go as far as putting it open to work on your LinkedIn. I'm talking more informally in conversations that you're already having with these individuals let them know. In fact, I was just speaking with um, somebody yesterday who I never probably, it's a, I never would have approached this person. Um, I never would have imagined that they would leave their organization and they're, you know, let me know about new opportunities. Um, and now that person is, you know, certainly on my radar, whereas before that conversation, they may not have been. Um, so it's okay to, say, hey, I'm interested in, in learning, you know, even if you're not certain that you want to make a move or need to make a move, um, yeah. you know, be after, be opportunistic, be, be open. Yeah, I think it's just great to leave yourself open to hearing about it, listening to opportunity. If you don't yeah. like what you see, delete the email or, or politely hang up the phone. But um, the referrals, you helping a friend out by saying, Hey, I just heard about this great opportunity. It's not the right timing or the right position for me. Boy, what a way to make friends by giving someone a good referral like that. Yeah, and we we very much as executive recruiters appreciate and love referrals. A lot of the candidates who we end up placing are referred to us by somebody else in our network who we initially reached out to. So if it's not for you, by all means, um, pass that opportunity along. Give them our contact information if there's somebody in your network who might benefit from hearing about it. That sounds great. And Brittany, you are on deck all right. um, this this is like one of those things. I, I'm literally I've said this a hundred times and I'm going to do it. I'm going to write the book when I retire from this job uh, and write it. Top interviewing mistakes, lawyer, top mistakes, lawyers made on job interviews. And, and everyone's going to think it's fiction because they're going to scratch their head and say, I can't believe a lawyer would do that. But every day 
we have we have feedback sessions with uh, the hiring managers, whether it's the CEO, CHRO, the general counsel, um, and they tell us something a lawyer did, and we're like, I can't believe it. The interview is so critical and there's some acting involved so you can't go in there all stiff and tense and or and or rehearsed it's so critical that anything you say on an interview can be used against you so you want to make sure you go into these interviews well prepared anyway I'm passing it off to Brittany this is of all the things we're going to talk about today top interviewing mistakes is definitely number one on my list to pay attention to yeah, thank you, John. I couldn't agree more. Um, we could have easily dedicated an entire webinar to this topic alone, but we tried to pick kind of the the top mistakes and what not to do, and for uh, it, as well as some tips for what to do to have a successful interview. Um, if I could only give one tip to everybody listening out there, it's this first bullet point: don't talk too much. I cannot tell you how many candidates we've had who have literally talked themselves right out of contention. Um, and it, it generally reveals itself and starts from the opening question in the interview, which is typically open-ended and tell me about yourself. If you ramble for several minutes, I can almost guarantee you, you have already lost the attention of your interviewer and anything you say thereafter is may not even be heard or it will not be as valued as it would have been otherwise. Um, and, and this is this is tough. This is something that takes practice. So we prep every one of our candidates before they interview with one of our clients. And we have a more comprehensive you know, preparation that we put them through. We talk about this. Um, and still, we will have individuals going in front of our clients who talk, talk, talk. And the feedback from the client is they were really chatty. I couldn't really get a word in edgewise. I wasn't able to ask a lot of questions. I have concerns about their ability to listen. I have concerns about their ability to distill information. I have concerns about their self-awareness. That's another one. And lack of self-awareness is a strong indicator of low EQ. Um, all of these organizations organizations care very much about emotional intelligence, right? So think about kind of all of the observations and assumptions that are being made about you as a prospective candidate just by talking too much. Um, this is something that I think takes practice. So I, I can sit here and tell you, I can prep my candidates, hey, um, strive for a 50-50 dialogue, have your elevator pitch ready, you know, don't talk for more than a, a minute, minute and a half before taking a break, read the room, um, look at your interviewer's nonverbal cues, if they appear engaged and interested, maybe you can continue providing additional detail, if they seem to be signaling a desire to move on, wrap up your response. I tell folks this all day long, and inevitably I still have some candidates who go in and continue to talk. So my advice for you beyond just preparing right before the interview is to be seeking um, feedback all along. You know, whether it's just improving your uh, communication in your current role, um, ask those people around you, how are you received and what feedback do you have? And chances are, if you're talking too much in an interview, you're talking too much in other settings. And if you have folks who you can trust, uh, I would be seeking out that that feedback proactively and, you know, continuously working on self-improvement. Um, so then when it does come time, when you're seeking a new opportunity, you've already been practicing how to be really concise with your communication. Um, so do not talk too much. Be concise. Pay attention to the nonverbal cues. Um, but, if but you don't have the ability to read a room, that's a concern for a CEO. I, I want to throw out the one one other issue people tend to have is you talked about a 50-50, meaning I talk 50% of the time, the interviewer talks 50% of the time. What about when you get one of these knucklehead interviewers that never stops talking and doesn't give you a chance to talk? Is that bad? What do you do? Sit there and quiet? 
Yeah, that's another thing, right? And I think we've all had that experience where the person is just talking and telling you about the organization and you leave the meeting feeling like I didn't have an opportunity to advocate for myself or tell them anything about me. What do you do then? You do have to take matters into your own hand. Now, I never advise talking over the interviewer and interrupting, certainly not. But when that person naturally takes a pause, I think it's okay to say, hey, John, um, can I comment on that? I, I'd like to ask a question um, when that opportunity presents itself. So you really do need to take matters into your own hands and ensure that you are getting an opportunity to share the most compelling, relevant components of your experience. I always tell people to going into um, an interview, write down, you know, three or four accomplishments, um, pieces of your experience that are most relevant and impressive for the opportunity that you're interviewing for. And if nothing more, if you didn't have an opportunity to share more than these three points, um, at least share those. And if you have them kind of planned ahead or jotted down on a, a piece of paper, you're more likely to incorporate them in. But that's a really good point, John, because we we certainly have some clients who are talkers as well, and um, that that's not good for the candidate either. Another thing um, I want to touch on briefly is these behavioral based interview questions. We have been um, experiencing a, a lot of candidates who are being disqualified from the interview process because they're not effectively answering these questions. And by behavioral based interview questions, these are very popular CHROs always ask them. You could probably Google top behavioral interview questions asked by CROs to CHROs to um, prepare for this. But essentially, they're those questions that are asking um, about a situation in the past and kind of how you navigated that situation. Because you know, past behavior is a strong indicator for the future, right? Um, and there's a formulaic way to prepare for these. If you're all familiar with the STAR acronym, so that's Situation, Task, Action, Result, it's a really nice, concise way to you know, formulate your responses. But how do you prepare for these? Uh, I recommend prior to going into an interview, Think about maybe five examples of challenging, problematic situations that you have had to navigate throughout your career um, and go through kind of that, that STAR method and plug them in. What was the situation, the task, the action, and result? And then at least you have something to draw on because I can guarantee you will get these questions at some point in the interview process. And the last thing you want to do is be a deer in headlights and not be able to Think of an example while you're there. Um, so that's one that I see a lot of people um, not prepare for adequately and thus not perform well in the interview. Um, not having a good response for why are you interested in the opportunity, that's another one. That is a question that you will always receive why this company? Why this opportunity? Um, and it needs to be compelling. You need give, to give me it. an example of two dumb answers to that question. Um, the why location. Are you interested oh, in it's a short commute. I don't I like want my to be the general job. counsel. Yeah. Yeah. The answer should not be about why you want to leave your current situation. It shouldn't be because you like the location or it's a shorter commute. Sure, at some point that can be icing on the cake, but it needs to be what is it about this opportunity, this organization, the growth, the mission, the leadership, the culture, the ability to make an impact that really resonates with you. And the interviewer, whether it be a CHRO or CEO, they need to feel that that's genuine and there's passion. I've had so many clients come back and say, it seems like Max doesn't, isn't even interested in, in this opportunity. I wasn't really, you know, picking up on his enthusiasm. I think some people too don't want to come across as desperate. So they're a little too conservative with showing their enthusiasm. And it's a balance. You don't need to be jumping off the walls, but they need to know that you are interested. It's genuine. And there's a compelling reason that is specific to that organization um, that is 
you know, driving your exploration of that opportunity. So that's a really important one. And it's going to come up in every interview. The last thing I'll, I'll touch on briefly is neglecting to ask smart questions. And by smart questions, I'm talking about questions that really reveal to you the cultural fit and what that CEO is for example, is looking for in an ideal candidate, there's questions you can ask that essentially give you the answers to the test, and then you can just respond accordingly. So I'll give you an example. And of course, you could make this more specific to the industry or organization. But generally speaking, you know, how would you describe the culture here? And what type of individual tends to thrive in your team and contribute positively to the company culture? Then they're going to tell you kind of, here's everything that we're looking for. Here's what our culture is all about. And you can respond accordingly and, you know, in a way that demonstrates um, the way that, you know, you have that experience, you exhibit those same values. And um, so one, it, you know, it shows that you're you know, genuinely interested in learning how you align and how you can make an impact. Um, while revealing to you what those expectations are. I, I want to um, jump yep. in on this. Max and I just just literally hot off the press um, in, uh, prepped the candidate for an interview. And we, we, we put this together. We've had this for years that one of the things that's, that, that gets you in the door is your resume and your experience. But what gets you hired is what's not on your resume. It's who you are, what you're all about. And one, one of the mis interview mistakes I feel people make is it's all about their experience. So oh, I'm a securities lawyer. I do contracts. I do m and I do litigation. I do IP, whatever it is. What they don't do is tell who you are, what you're all about. So my new tip is this. You ask that question. Can you share with me what type of person is most successful on your leadership team? If you're talking to CHRO, CEOs, whoever. If I'm talking to a general counsel, can you share with me the culture of your organization that you're looking to build here and what kind of person would be the most successful on your team? So asking these people, they'll tell you. Everyone says they have this very unique culture. It's collaborative. It's team oriented. We're humble. Everyone says the same thing. We have a very unique culture that no one else has but us. And they all have the exact same answer. Anyway, you listen to their crappy answer. Their answer will be exactly as I just shared with you. And then you think back to who you are, what you're all about, who taught you that same culture, the value of hard work. And so this woman was this woman that we're prepping. She wasn't giving us an answer that we like. And we go, what did you learn? Like, what were your roots? What did and she goes, well, you know, my father was a lawyer and he he worked full time while he went to law school and he showed me the determination and hard work. And every day I go in there. I, I become what I've become because of that hard work ethic. And my grandmother was this very empathetic person. She grew up overseas. She immigrated to the United States. She taught me the value of how to treat people and how to listen to people and how to be empathetic. And Max and I were like, oh my God, this is the perfect place in an interview to talk about who you are, what you're all about, who mentored you, where did you come from? You know, on an interview, no one can say, where did you grow up? Were you born in the United States? These are all illegal questions. Talk in terms of, you know, what what brought you here? What How did you get here? Obviously, if you're in that room, you are incredibly successful. You graduated from a good law school. You worked at a law firm. You, you've succeeded in-house. In, in, whatever the case, you've been successful. Somebody had to turn you on or, or keep you mentored or motivated to get into that room. Perfect yeah. time to let them know who you are. So that, uh, that's one of my new uh, interview tips. I, one Max, last, I'm, one gonna let you, I'm not gonna let you do it. My favorite interview tip of all time is when you're asked what's your greatest strength, where you bring this the, the room the most value. How do you answer that, Max? You don't answer it, when, but most people answer it with, I think, I think I'm this, I think I'm that. but. Your, what you think of yourself is your identity, but what others think of you is your reputation. So to that end, it is very important to share, you know, 
what did you what does your ceo say about you what is your what has a board member said about the how you are a strategic advisor because when the the listener is going to hear what you're saying what others thought of you and they're going to place themselves in that position so it is important to rely on reputation but john i think as uh, as we went through another search you can't go overboard right yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. but that Max, that is Max. so true. It, it, it's uh, that's a much more humble way of answering the question. What are your strengths? Speaking in terms of what other people have said about you. My CEO has often commended me for my ability to do this. This type of feedback often shows up in my performance reviews. It also just adds some credibility to what you're saying, right? And it's a good way to self-advocate, which is a very important in an interview without coming across as boastful, because again, you're just able to lean on your um, reputation and then, you know, say all these wonderful things about yourself, but, you know, through what other people have told you. Yeah. Sure. And a lot of, a lot of what we're sharing right now is, is substantive, but we also know with substantive due process, there's procedural. And it's also important to understand that you make a first impression once. And in this process, in, mod in most of our search processes, the first time somebody from the client is going to meet you is going to be via Zoom. And, and presenting via Zoom is very different than presenting in person. And it seems simple. It seems very elementary. But make sure the camera is faced here. <laughs> you can only imagine if we. I start talking like, I mean, one, I lose the rest of my hairline. But two... <laughs> It is just, I mean, it, it's a very, it, it, you, you, you can't come across as a professional that they're looking, an executive looking to hire if the screen, if you're not looking at the camera and, uh, and it's not centered. So I, I do recommend that it, it seems simple, but you make a first impression. And if the first impression is virtual, make mm -hmm. sure that your facial expressions, the body language is also there as well. Yeah. I, I had a candidate once who had a bad camera angle. I'll never forget it. And the client, luckily he didn't disqualify him because this guy was exceptional, but he said, hey, can, can you tell your, your Canada uh, to adjust his camera so I'm not staring up his nose the entire time when we regroup things? <laughs> and I did tell him that he was mortified, um, but yeah, pay attention to your camera angle. Yeah, and, and I'm just gonna close this slide out because we're running out of time with, Lock your pets outside of the room. <laughs> no cats or dogs in the room while you're uh, while you're interviewing. So make sure it's in a good professional setting. Um, and then we're going to finish off here on the last slide. And then I'm going through this. I'm I'm thinking uh, we're seeing a lot of questions building up. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at these questions, try to answer some of the questions, put up the response on the website. And by the way, I forgot to mention early on, um, this webinar is going to is re being recorded. Um, it'll be showing up in a couple of weeks on our website. And if you feel free to uh, share with your friends or uh, take a look at it before you go on an interview. So my my component, and I'm going to open it up to anyone to jump in here, is top mistakes when negotiating and accepting an offer. Um, and, and one thing we've had a big change in the industry over the last couple of years where you're not allowed to ask people what they make. Um, and, you know, when we're when we're negotiating a high level executive comp, um, people are going to want to know what you're making. And, and I'll tell you, the one area in particular most criti critical is a long term incentive. So. If you have unvested equity or unvested long-term incentive that's paid out in cash or whatever it is, you'll typically have a statement. You don't just tell someone, oh, I have a million dollars in unvested equity and you think they're gonna write you a check for a million dollars. You're going to have to come with a statement. And, and, and just so you understand how that works, um, it's broken up where um, typical, most companies, and I say most because not it's not a given, will will try to make you whole for your first year that the first amount that was is unvested that would be vested in the first year a component of what you're walking away from in your second year and typically the third year falls off their their mindset is hey we're going to give you our own equity that you're you're working for the value and so forth um when i say waiting too long to discuss compensation what i mean is I talk, I've talked to many people um, that went through a process, not through me, um, and, and they went all the way through many rounds of interviews and, and were afraid to bring up compensation. 
And, you know, to, to get to the finish line with a compensation that's not going to work for you just makes no sense. And it's it's a waste of time on the company side. It's a waste of time on your side. So I, I it, there's a place to say maybe it's not the first interview. Go on the first interview with the objective. Hey, let me get them excited about my candidacy. They call you back, say, OK, we want to come back again. Or a recruiter calls you and says, hey, I'm interested. They want to bring you back in. Let's bring it to the table. Let's not let's not make any uh, uh, you know assumptions that they're going to get us to the finish line and 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 make me an offer I can't refuse. Making assumptions too. Now, when companies are going to advertise an opening, you'll see a range for the compensation, a low and a high. Most people make the assumption, hey, they're going to pay me on the high end because I'm so darn good. Um, don't make that assumption. So you know, if if this job says three to ten years of experience. And it's going to pay two hundred to three hundred base. Don't think you automatically have an in at three hundred, and you have three or four years of experience. It's probably not going to happen. So um, I'm just saying, have a conversation, and also be transparent. You know, give them an idea. They're going to ask if you're coming into a, a high six figure, seven figure position. They're going to want to know where you're coming from, and and saying, oh, I don't want to tell you it really doesn't go over very well. You might have expectations for where you need to be um, and, 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 and look, do your research and understand uh, what the market's looking to pay, but you should have some idea of what the market, what, what you're looking for to go in there. The next mistake I say is piecemeal negotiating. What I mean by that is you go in the first day and you negotiate salary. Then you get that. Then you try to negotiate a sign-on bonus. Then you get that. All right, now let me try to negotiate vacation. I'll just say nothing makes anyone angrier than piecemeal negotiating. What my bottom line is, go in with what will it take you to get you to accept this offer and go into negotiations with, this is what I need to accept the offer. If you make me this, I'm ready to start on February 6th. You know, give them a specific date. That makes a big difference. From an onboarding standpoint, going into any new position with the mindset, I'm going to make change as soon as I get there. You know, my 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 rule of thumb is listen, listen, and listen. You know, listen to the people you're working with, listen to the people who are above you, listen to the business. Um, you know, you don't make any assumptions for what you're going to do until after you get there and make these, uh, uh, hear what people are looking for. Uh, Brit Brittany and I just interviewed an internal candidate on a GC search. And one interesting thing he said, he goes, you know, the, the GC who's retiring did such an amazing job. The business loves him. The business loves him, everyone and the executive team. So I, the, the, listening to that, I'm thinking to myself, the, the, the person who goes in there thinking they're going to reorg the law department or restructure something, um, they don't know what they're walking into. They need to walk in and understand the business likes the way it's working today. So don't go in and change it. And, and that particular company, the previous GC came in trying to make all these changes and it just stirred everybody up. And, and unfortunately, the tenure wasn't wasn't going to work. I apologize, but we're we're run out of we've run out of time. I think we did set the record number of people showing up today. And Wendy, I appreciate you coming. Uh Brittany's a superstar on our team. And Max is the, the 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 took the least number of years to hit seven figure revenue for our firm. I mean, he's just an all-star. So feel free to reach out to Max. Uh, if any of you have any questions, let us know. You can reach out to us directly. We hope to see you next month for the next, our, our advisors will be back. The, the, the advisors bring so much value to everyone. And one of the things we've done is we've packaged our advising with our executive search model and it's increased our stick rate and the, the, the person's success rate walking in the door quite a bit. So um, if anybody's looking for a coach or an advisor, having someone who sat in that seat previously, they know what they're doing. Their EQ is, is second to none. Um, and uh, it, it would be a, an incredibly valuable experience. As, as the advisor said, it's a career 
changing move. You know, we've had people that have used our advisors and that's the feedback that they're getting. So again, thank you everyone for coming. We look forward to seeing you next week. Get on our radar. We'd love to help you out. We'd love to help your friends. Uh, keep us in mind if you're uh, looking for something better or something new. Take care.